Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to the first episode of Quite Serious Adoration, where I praise a game that is either one of my all-time favorites or was criminally underrated when it was initially released. And today we'll be talking about Beneath a Steel Sky, the second game made by Revolution Software. This is the second video in my Revolution Retrospective series, so if you haven't seen my Lure of the Temptress review, I suggest you watch that before watching this one. Before we get into this review, I need to point out something very important. This game is a masterpiece and a must-play. It is one of the best, if not the best, adventure game ever created, and it's free on GOG right now. And although this video is going to be as spoiler-free as possible, I highly suggest you play the game before watching it. I won't be spoiling anything major, however there will be some minor spoilers, such as some puzzle solutions and minor plot points. Now without further ado, let's start this review. If you took my advice and just came back from playing the game, or if you decided to stay to hear more, grab a drink, relax, and enjoy the video. Charles Sissel, co-founder of Revolution Software, always wanted to collaborate with Dave Gibbons, comics artist well known for his works in 2000 AD and his collaboration with Alan Moore on the Watchmen miniseries. And while working at Activision, Charles contacted Dave, hoping to work with him. Unfortunately, that collaboration did not happen, due to Activision's collapse and reorganization in 1990. Luckily though, Charles and Dave remained friends. And since Lord of the Temptress was both a critical and commercial success, Charles and his friend Dave Cummins decided to contact Dave Gibbons to work with him on their next game. Two years later, one of the greatest point-and-click adventures ever made was born. Beneath a Steel Sky was initially titled Underworld, but then later changed due to the release of Ultima Underworld. I'm glad that happened because I think Beneath a Steel Sky is a much better title. The game starts off with a beautifully drawn intro that gives us a bit of backstory on the protagonist. You play as Robert Foster, a man who was saved by a tribe of nomads as a child and has been living with them ever since. Said nomads found Robert at the site of an aircraft crash that resulted in his mother's death. Rather than leaving him to die, they decided to raise him and teach him their hunting and scavenging ways, while he started developing his own skills. I'm your friend. Call me Joey. The tribe leader often warns Robert of his visions of impending evil. According to Robert, this has happened many times before. This time, however, his visions prove to be true, as a helicopter approaches the tribe and opens fire at them. A few moments later, the firing ceases and the copter lands. A group of security officers from Union City declare that they're looking for Robert, saying that he doesn't belong here and that they want to take him back home. Despite the tribe leader's cries of protest, Robert gives himself up, hoping that it would stop the security officers from killing the rest of his tribe. It didn't. While flying to Union City, the copter's controls get hijacked and it crashes, giving Robert the opportunity to escape. He enters this factory and overhears a conversation between an officer and a factory technician, which reveals to him that he was brought here under the orders of Link. Link with a C, not with a K. Although it would have been hilarious if it was Link who gave the orders. I just wonder what Robert is up to. Now, before we get into why this game is a masterpiece, let's take a look at some of its flaws. Because no matter how brilliant a game is, there is no such thing as a flawless game. And thankfully, not counting any minor flaws or nitpicks, this game has only two noticeable flaws. Number 1. The Scanner and Subway Deaths Much like most adventure games at the time, you can die in this game. And while most deaths provide fair warning, there are two deaths in this game that seemed pretty unfair. First of which is the scanner death. Early on in the game, you acquire an ID card that allows you access to both the elevators and the link terminals. However, if you use it at the security headquarters, it denies you entry and the clerk gets suspicious. You could either lie to him and move on, or give him the card. If you do so, he checks it, then tells you there must have been a glitch in the system. Try the card again, and this happens. To be fair, it not working the first time should be reason enough not to try it again. And one could argue that the clerk pointing his gun at you should be warning enough. But don't you think death is a bit too harsh of a punishment? I guess it's not that bad anyway. Definitely not as bad as the other death. Picture this, 
You're walking down a tunnel and then out of nowhere this thing grabs you and pulls you into its hole. And here's why I think this death was completely unfair. You have no way of knowing that there's something in that hole. There's absolutely no warning, such as glimpses of the monster's eyes or something. Robert just says that there's something horrible in there when it's already too late to run away. And a giant hole just isn't enough to keep the player cautious. In fact, when you see the hole, your first instinct is probably gonna be to look at it, because the game taught us that looking at stuff is safe. But as soon as you do, you die. You might think you could ignore it, you can't. And the worst thing about this death is that the game doesn't even allow you to experiment without killing you. Every time you want to try an item, you die. All for nothing, by the way. Because the only way to get past this thing is to insert a light bulb into this barely noticeable socket. You could say that this is the developers teaching us a valuable life lesson that sometimes a solution to a huge problem is right under our noses. I say, screw life lessons, it's been ages since I last saved. Oh well, at least there are no dead ends in this game. Number 2. Virtual Theater As I mentioned in my previous video, Virtual Theater is a great idea that was executed poorly. The goal was to make NPCs more lifelike, where they walk around town, talk to other NPCs, and not stay stationary in one position. It resulted in many frustrating moments where you had to look for a specific NPC in order to progress. The good news is, this issue isn't present in Beneath the Steel Sky. The bad news is, this isn't because they fixed the engine. It's because they toned it down. This time around, most NPCs stay in one place, and those who move around only move around within one or two rooms. To be fair, the game still turned out great without a refined virtual theater, but removing its best features seemed like a cop-out to me. For example, imagine you visit a restaurant and order lamb chops with sautéed vegetables and pudding on the side. The vegetables were good and the pudding was great, yet the lamb chops were too salty and dry. You tell the restaurant management and they promise you that it won't happen again. The next time you visit, you get the pudding and the veggies, but you don't get any lamb chops. This is not fixing the problem. And it's not like none of the virtual theater issues are present in this game. You still can't walk through characters, so you tend to get stuck behind them every now and again. And if you ask Joey to do something for you and you're in the way, he just says, You're in my way, Foster. And then ignores your order. You have to tell him again to do it. And that's not even mentioning the times you have to wait for him to show up. Thankfully, it doesn't happen too often, and this time around your companion is actually important, and isn't just given arbitrary tasks that make no sense. Anyway, those are the major flaws. Neither of them detract from the game's overall quality because the game is that good. And now that we've got the flaws out of the way, let's talk about the game's strengths, starting with the awesome interface. As I mentioned in my Lure of the Temptress review, I'm not a fan of LucasArts' Verbs interface and Sierra's Actions interface. At the time, most developers were following either LucasArts or Sierra, save for a few exceptions such as Delphine Software with their drop-down menu. Revolution's first game used Delphine's interface, which isn't great, but still better than what was popular at the time. Beneath a Steel Sky, however, used the sweetest, simplest interface ever made for point-and-click adventures. You click the left mouse button to look at stuff and the right mouse button to interact with them. What type of interaction depends on the object you clicked on. So if it's an item that can be picked up, you automatically pick it up. If it's usable, you automatically use it, and so on. I'm not sure if this was the first game to utilize this interface, though it probably was, since the interface template in Adventure Game Studio was named after this game. At the very least, Beneath a Steel Sky popularized it. One might argue that it makes gameplay a lot simpler, and I agree. But I think that's a good thing, because now developers can focus on making fun, sensible puzzles instead of stumping you with semantics. The interface was only one of the many improvements over their previous game. Another improvement was the voice acting. 
Back in Lure of the Temptress, the closest we got to voice acting was this. In this game, however, every line This sounds like a job for Captain Welder. Well, almost every line is voice acted. No matter how well written the dialogue is, poor voice acting would definitely have a negative effect on it. Survival of the fittest, I'm afraid, Mr. Gruff. Let's examine basic survival instincts for a moment. I'm a big, powerful carnivore, and you are a weak, defenseless herbivore. And thankfully, the voice acting in this game is quite good. We cut the power to the elevator, and a crash has blocked the walkway. What if he comes in here? You'll be fine. We posted guards. I wouldn't call it outstanding, but considering that A, it was their first game with voice acting, and B, it turned out much better than some other adventure games at the time. What do you want? I'd say it deserves praising. You don't look so good. Well, thanks very much. Full marks for your bedside manner. It hits a perfect balance between silly and believable. Now, why would you want to do that? There's nothing in the gap but sand and savages. But that's where I live. Ooh, how ghastly for you, my dear. Which works really well with the writing. But more on that later. You're simply too healthy. Most bodies would reject your organs. I'd say the only voice actor that could have been better was the guy who voiced Robert. He wasn't bad, but I felt that he could have conveyed Robert's emotions a lot better. Why you murdering? Well, Reich, whoever you are, it's retribution time. You've made a mistake. I'm not Overman. However, it is a bit weird that sometimes the voice acted lines don't match the on-screen text. Is that a can of lubricant? Yes. One squirt is just the job. I'd never be without a can of lubricant. Apparently, the reason for that was that at first the developers sent the lines to the Royal Shakespeare Company. But they weren't happy with the results, so they scheduled a re-recording session and hired actual voice actors and actresses this time around. They had to learn the hard way that you can't use stage actors to do a voice actor's job. I wish more developers would learn this lesson too. From good voice acting to an excellent soundtrack, this game just keeps on surprising me. Dave Cummins, the guy who wrote the game's story and dialogue, also composed the music. And what a brilliant job he did. Every single piece fits so well with its respective area. And although each track is about a minute long, you wouldn't notice the loop while playing the game because of how seamless it is. And each area has its own track, so there's a very impressive amount of variety, such as the quirky theme of Dr. Burke, the futuristic melody of Link Space, and some light jazz in St. James's Club. There's even this hilariously upbeat tune in the Bellevue area. It is so out of place in a game with such a serious story, and I love it. The track's happy tone, in juxtaposition with the dark plot, just makes the whole situation a lot darker. It's almost as if the people living here are blissfully unaware that they're being oppressed. I need to point out that you've been hearing the Windows enhanced version of the music. When playing the GOG version on ScumVM, you can choose the Microsoft GS Wavetable Synth option in the audio section. Otherwise, the music will sound more like this. On to the visuals. 
I adore the way this game looks. When designing the game, their goal was to create a bridge between comic books and video games, and I honestly think it worked, at least for the time. Dave Gibbons did most of the art in this game from backgrounds to sprites to character designs, while Les Pace and Steve Ince did the background coloring. Gibbons also created the comic book that was translated into the game's intro. By getting the game on GOG, you can even download scans of said comic book. It's only a few pages long, but it's still pretty awesome. During production, Gibbons was worried that he won't be able to give the characters proper expressions due to how small their faces are and how limited the palette is. He even suggested making the character design more like that of Prince of Persia's or Another World's. But after seeing the results, I'm glad they opted for more detailed characters. I mean, look at this! I crack up every time I see Dr. Burke shaking his head like that. I'm just impressed by the amount of detail that went into this game's visuals in general. 1994 was a brilliant year that had a smorgasbord of great games with beautiful graphics, many of which were made by giants of the industry. And for a small team with a small budget to be able to compete with them? Now that's impressive. But what would a beautiful looking adventure game be without puzzles? Now, I'm no genius but I consider myself a smart enough guy, which is why I rarely use hints when playing adventure games. I only use them if A, I'm not enjoying the game so I want to go through it as fast as possible, or B, the puzzle was not well designed. Whether it wasn't properly signposted or it relied on moon logic, I just can't be bothered figuring it out. Thankfully, almost all puzzles in this game were well designed. Sure, there were one or two that could have been made better, but definitely weren't big stumpers. The majority of the puzzles in this game were very enjoyable and were a perfect balance of challenging and fun. Take this puzzle for example. You need to get a tour ticket from the travel agency, but it will take a month to get the ticket and Robert doesn't have that much time. There has to be something to give the clerk in order to speed things up. Spoiler alert by the way, if you don't want the solution for this puzzle to be spoiled for you, you can skip to this part of the video. You've been warned. As it turns out, in order to get your ticket immediately, you need to swap it with this motorbike magazine. As random as that sounds, the clues were all there. If you ask Joey to scan the clerk's computer, he tells you that it's infected with a virus. Tell that to the clerk and he won't believe you. So Joey will prove his ability to scan by scanning his brain. In doing so, you'll find out that he's obsessed with motorbikes. Where to find the magazine, however, is the second part of the puzzle. You find it in this room under a pillow. How do you know it's there? Well, you already have the card of this room's owner. If you check the owner's personal info on any link terminal, you'll find that he recently paid for a magazine subscription. The magazine's name is Dangerous Bikes. And since motorbikes are illegal, something you find out during your conversation with the clerk, the magazine is probably in a safe hiding place. And there are only a few hotspots here anyway, so you're bound to find the magazine underneath the pillow. And that's just one example. Of course, not every puzzle in this game is as well signposted as this one, but most of them are. And the ones that aren't are at least understandable. You won't have to search for a golden needle in a haystack to exchange for a coat, that's for sure. As for the game's plot, I adore it, and I'm gonna do my best not to spoil anything major. On the surface, the game appears to have yet another post-apocalyptic story, but there's actually a lot more going on. The game is set in a post-apocalyptic Australia which consists of six states and a vast wasteland called The Gap. The state you are brought to is called Union City and is the second largest state in Neo-Australia, the first being Hobart Corporation. Apparently, Union and Hobart are at an economic war with each other and are also polar opposites when it comes to their politics. But here's the thing, the game never tells you any of this. It only focuses on Robert's journey. You learn about all these things by either reading some news articles using the link terminal or reading the game's manual, which thankfully comes with the GOG version and is definitely worth a read. The rest is up to your imagination and interpretations. And I love that. 
It could have gotten deeper into the lore, it could have made the game needlessly longer just to squeeze in as much exposition as it can, risking it becoming too boring or preachy. But it didn't. It trusted the player and gave them the choice to research the lore on their own. It focused on one thing and one thing only. Robert's journey. His struggles, his own past, and his own problems. And the plot does get deeper and darker the closer you are to the end. Yet it only vaguely hints at the lore of this post-apocalyptic dystopia. I love it when games do that. Giving you a simple yet effective plot while providing you the tools to delve into the deeper lore of the game on your own. Some of my favorite games adopted this method and I'm glad this is one of them. Now that we know that the plot is great, let's take a look at the writing. Because believe it or not, in a genre that relies almost entirely on conversations, poor writing could easily ruin the gamer's experience with the game. Apparently, while writing the script, Charles Sissel and Dave Cummins weren't seeing eye to eye. Charles wanted the writing to be more serious, while Dave wanted it to be silly, much like LucasArts games. The compromise they reached was absolute genius. The result was dialogue that's funny and witty, yet serious enough to deliver the game's dark plot. And much like that happy tune I mentioned, the humor in this game just makes the story a lot more disturbing, yet still providing genuinely funny jokes. If you've ever watched Brazil, you'd know what I'm talking about. It's like everyone is insane and you're the only one who's aware of it. This scene is a perfect example of the character's detachment from reality. Howard Hobbins, you've won tonight's star prize! Life Imprisonment! Speaking of which, the characters are also very well written. Each character is unique and entertaining in its own way. From the kooky Dr. Burke to the flirtatious Miss Piermont to the relatable Anita, each character feels believable, even though they're very cartoony. I just adore the writing in this game. It's funny, it's dark, and it provides social commentary that's subtle enough to sting without seeming too preachy. Seeing how this is Revolution's second game, I just can't help but be impressed. And that's Beneath a Steel Sky, a masterpiece that still holds up to this day. If you enjoy point-and-click adventures or are just a fan of brilliant writing, you owe it to yourself to play this game. I mean, you don't even have any excuse, it's free right now. From well-designed puzzles, to beautiful visuals, to a very gripping story, the game has everything. Many people remember Revolution Software for their Broken Sword series. And as much as I love Broken Sword, I think the team reached their peak with this game. Charles Sissel mentioned his interest in making a sequel, but for now, the team's main focus is Broken Sword. Oh, and speaking of which, as of writing this review, the entire Broken Sword franchise is on a huge sale on Steam, including Revolution's 25th anniversary documentary. If you're a fan of the genre, you owe it to yourself to buy them. A bit of friendly advice, I would stay away from Broken Sword 4, but more on that in a later video. I love this series, especially the first three games, and I think they are must-plays to any fan of the genre. And since I'm making a Revolution Retrospective series, I had to mention this sale. And if you play these games, you'll be preparing yourself for my upcoming videos. In the next video, we'll take a look at Revolution's third game, Broken Sword The Shadow of the Templars. So I'll see you then, thanks for watching.